down on my face again Crying out I want you to hear my plea Come down and rescue me How long will it take Rescue me, fall on me 
Hey, welcome back to The Branch at Home. My name is Josh Brake. I am the Next Gen Minister at The Branch, and it's really, really good to see you today. I am on set of so many of The Branch Kids at Home videos, and as I'm sitting here and I'm making this video, uh, what I'm thinking about is that we are actually going to be following along Chris's new series, Where Do We Go From Here in Branch Kids at Home. We're talking about better decisions, fewer regrets. Galatians 6, 7 is the first passage of this series, and so we hope that you and your family will join us online as we walk through that together. Uh, also, something that's on my heart, something that is uh, really exciting to me is that we are starting a young adult ministry February 1st. Uh, I'm pumped about it. We're calling it The Well. We're gonna be meeting at the Vista Ridge campus. So if you're comfortable, you feel safe being in person, please join us from 7 to 8.30 every Monday night at the Vista Ridge campus starting February 1st. It's gonna be amazing. Uh, and so now, how about we uh, open up our sermon notes and we get ready uh, for the first message in the series where do we go from here? tell you it is a blessing to be back with you and I before I go any further I also want to say about how grateful I am uh, that you would pray for our family the way you've been praying for our family uh, and I know you're praying for uh, many others in our church who are walking through this same journey as well I got to tell you how thankful I am uh, just for the word that Josh Brake brought to you last week, and Hunter Wheatcraft brought an awesome word on the Farmer's Branch campus. Both of those words are online if you've missed them. We're blessed in so many ways with so many people who walk with the Lord, men and women, in our context that can bring a word of the Lord li literally on the spur of the moment uh, as they did last week, and I'm so greatly blessed for that. Um, I know, by the way, not everyone was able to be with us, but we had a, our first ever Wednesday night online virtual prayer event this week that a lot of our shepherds led us in for about 30 minutes, and it was awesome. Uh, maybe you were a part of that for 30 minutes as we just tapped in from wherever we were all over the city and uh, had a time of prayer together, and uh, technology's a blessing. I've gotten so much feedback from that. We're going to do it again pretty soon, I believe, and uh, so much feedback. So thank you for engaging with that right where you were. If you missed it, don't miss the next one. It was dynamite. It was a powerful and very quick 30 minutes. Time flies when you're in the presence of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Uh, and so speaking of prayer, I want to take just a moment now before we go any further, um, and uh, I want us to pray for our country. There's a lot of tension, obviously, in the air. Thank you very much, Captain Obvious. We're all, we're all aware of that. There's a lot of tension in the air right now. Um, but one of the things that I want to do is I want to pray over this next week and the coming transition of power in our country. Uh, there's a lot of rumors, a, a lot of uh, stories of anticipated tension and even expected violence this next week, both uh, at our nation's capital and potentially at state capitals. We just want to go ahead and in advance pray about that. Amen? Because uh, we have been in a country that has witnessed for centuries now uh, peaceful transitions of power, but we shouldn't take this for granted. So I want us to take for just a moment and pray for the peace of God and that there would be no violence this next week. Let's do that right now. Pray with me. Lord, we come together in the mighty name of your son Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And we ask that you would foil the plans of the enemy who's come to steal, kill, and destroy. Every single one of us knows what it is to have been used by the enemy in our life to bring harm, to bring confusion, to bring discord. All of us 
have experienced this in our own life. When we think back to things we shouldn't have said and actions that we shouldn't have taken. And so we all pray from a place of humility as people who've all fallen short of your glory. We do not pray from a self-righteous position. We pray from an acute awareness that all of us have fallen short of your glory, have done and have said things that have brought harm at some level and destruction at some level. And so we come in all humility and we ask in the name of Jesus that the plans of the enemy, and by the enemy I mean Satan, our adversary, that the plans of Satan would not come to fruition. That the plans would be foiled, Lord. That no lives would be lost, God. That things would come undone, Lord. And that your peace would reign. And we pray for every single person in our country including ourselves, that we would know you, Jesus, more intimately for who you truly are, revealed in the Gospels, confirmed by your Spirit. We pray that all of us would know you more intimately and be changed by you. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, there's a lot in our world that we have no control over. There's a lot in our world we have no say over. In fact, a lot of what we consume through our screens involves stories and people that live in different places where we don't live and where we are not. That's why we pray. But I do want you to know that we have a say in what happens where we are in our spheres of relationships, in the location where we occupy, we have a measure of leverage in what happens. And so today we begin a a new series that I'm calling Where Do We Go From Here? A Guide to Better Decisions. Who's interested in making better decisions? (laughs) All of us who've made some bad decisions, you know. How do you get wisdom? You get wisdom from good decisions. How do you learn to make Good decisions. You get that from making bad decisions. So I think we all are aware of that. Anytime I think of decisions, I I think of a married couple that was celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. I remember my grandparents when they celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. I was there. uh, I was 13 or 14 at the time. And um, I was was marveling at how many people wanted to ask my grandparents how they made it. In fact, my granddad came into the anniversary party, and he had an army helmet and a white flag. I didn't get that when I was 14. I was like, what does this have to do with marriage? You know, I understood that later. So it was this anniversary party, and this couple was answering questions. How did you make it so long? And the husband had a great answer. He said, when we were first married, we came to an agreement. I would make all the major decisions. She would make all the minor decisions. And in 60 years of marriage, we've never needed to make a major decision. (laughs) Now, one thing marriage will do is it'll give you an opportunity to talk often about how decisions get made. Life will do that. Now, Scripture is full of stories and insights about the power of choices and the leverage that a decision can make on the kind of life that you have. While the quality of our lives are impacted by the actions and the decisions of others, yes, they can also be impacted by our own choices and our own decisions. Where you are and what you're experiencing today has something to do with a decision you made yesterday or in the past. And where you will be tomorrow and what you experience tomorrow will have something to do with some kind of decision that you're making today. When I was 12, I went to a a summer camp, a Christian camp for two weeks. I had a counselor there that I instantly looked up to. He was a college athlete. And I made up a bunch of stories about me and my family that week just to get his attention. And we began this relationship. The beginning of the second week, I found out that on the last day of camp, 
your family was invited to show up at the camp for a family activity day. I was mortified because that meant the counselor would meet my family and be around my family through the day and might find out that all these stories I told him about my family and I weren't true. He'd realize I'd been lying to him. And so the whole second week of camp was miserable to me because I was realizing how am I going to keep these two worlds apart here? The night before my family arrived, I broke down and confessed to the counselor about the lies that I had been telling him just to get his attention. And he forgave me. I'm thankful for that. I'm sure my counselor's trust in me also took a hit. I lost the whole second week of an incredible camp completely to anxiety over my lies that I had told and what I was going to do about them. The quality of my life for that week was the fruit of a decision that I had made to lie about myself and my family. I lost a whole week that week. When I was in college, I took a difficult class my junior year in which I had an A going into the final. The final, though, was the largest percentage of the grade for my class. I was a communications major. This was a communication law class, a major class. It was a big deal. I kept telling myself I would study for it, but kept kicking the proverbial can down the road. Then came the day before the final, and I said, I'm going to pull an all-nighter at a place called the Kettle there in Abilene. And so I went with my best friend who I was taking the class with. He's, he's still in radio television today. People see him all the time. And I went with him, and we stayed up all night at the kettle to study. We never cracked a book. We ate $30 worth of food, and we told jokes through the night, finally started studying about 5 a.m., went back to our room after a couple hours of studying, slept for an hour, got up, took the final. I made a D on the final. And my, my grade dropped from an A for that entire semester to a D the last day of class because of one test that I didn't study for. And then I had some explaining to do to my father who I'd been telling the whole semester I've got an A in that class. And I had a C on the report card. Years ago when Skylar was but a baby, we were just starting out as a young family in Florida. I got a postcard in the mail from a from a corporation called Family Savers. And it was marketing itself as this buyer's club, like Sam's or like Costco, that was just beginning to rise on the northwest coast. And so you had to sign up by appointment only to check out Family Savers. So we went to this, these two massive warehouses that it were full of all this stuff. I saw boats and furniture and refrigerators. I saw so much stuff. And I'm here at Family Savers and... And they're talking about how much better they are than Sam's and these other places that I had heard of, but I'd never heard of Family Savers, and I was with this unbelievable salesperson who was so nice, and when he sat down at his desk behind him, he had like the Thompson Chain reference Bible. He didn't even know I was a young minister, so I thought, I'm dealing with a Christian here, man. And he's talking about Family Savers, and then he's, he lowers the boom and says, now you can be a part of this club and have access to all this stuff at amazing discounts for the low, low price of $1,549. A lot of money to, to a young father. It's a lot of money today to an old father, I'm learning. But it's a lot of money to a young father in his late 20s. I said, I don't know. He said, you can put it on a credit card. So I put it on that credit card, and then I took money I had saved for a vacation for us and paid off that credit card and thought, I've made a good decision. I've become a part of the Buyers Club Family Savers. Turned out to be family suckers. <laughs> Six months later, they were gone, packed up in the middle of the night, entire warehouses, offices, gone. I was duped. Family savers had made us family suckers. And they wound up the subject of a story on 60 Minutes about a year later. They were eventually prosecuted. We never got our money back. And we didn't get to take the vacation that we had been saving for. Because I spent the money at family savers. Now those three stories, and I got more. Those three stories involve choices and decisions that I made that had something to do 
with my experience later. One involved lying, one involved not studying, one involved being unwise in a financial transaction. And the last one, my wife and my son were impacted to a degree because of the lost funds. In all three cases, I had to deal with regret and consequences as a result. I've made more costly decisions and choices than that in my life. But I do know this. What I'm currently experiencing on any given day is often tied to some kind of choice or decision I've made in the past. Sometimes the choice and the decision is just to how I've responded to something that I didn't have control over. And what I experience in the future is tied often to a choice or decision I made in the day. I'm not leaving God out of this, nor am I dismissing God's sovereignty. Rather, God in his sovereignty has decreed that human beings play a part in what happens. I'll show you this in Scripture in just a moment. We contribute to where we are in life, for better or for worse. We don't, we're not, we don't make the only contribution, but we are a variable. And then there are decisions and choices we face when we bear responsibility for other people. As a parent, as an employer, as a leader in an organization, and the fruit of our decisions can sometimes impact lives. Now, I'm going to be walking through some particular scriptures in this series. That's where I'm going to be teaching from. But if you've been getting my weekly email, you know I've been recommending you just a partner book for this series for you to read along during the week. I don't talk about what's in the book. I let him talk about what's in the book. I'm going to teach you the word. What this book does, this book's by Andy Stanley. It's called Better Decisions, Fewer Regrets. It is a great little supplemental resource for this series. I want to encourage you to order it off Amazon. Andy doesn't even know I'm promoting his book, and I'm, I'm telling you, I'm his best friend right now, aren't I? But I'm telling you, I want you to snag this book off Amazon. It'll be a blessing to you to read during the week. It's a short little book. It's ideal for talking about in a discussion group. That's why a lot of our small groups are doing this over a Zoom and so on and so forth. Um, what I want to do is I want to lay a foundation today for going forward by showing you a, a, a few key passages of Scripture because there's a foundational principle I want you to see and to be locked in on foundationally as we start. And here's the deal. Here it is. We play a part when it comes to the kind of world we live in, the kind of people we become, and the kind of lives we have. We play a part when it comes to the kind of world we live in, the kind of people we become, and the kind of lives we have. Our choices and decisions matter. So let me show you a few passages to consider. Genesis chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. You're reading the story of creation. I want you to look at this closely. And in Genesis 2, 4 through 7, the writer says this, this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up. Listen why. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no one to work the ground. Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Go back to verse 5. What are the two reasons why shrubs and plants haven't sprung up? One of them had to do with God. He hadn't sent rain yet. There's a second reason. It had to do with there was no one to work the ground. This is the story behind the creation of the first human beings. Human beings were making it possible for shrubs and plants to spring up. They had to work the ground. A human being was involved in releasing the potential of creation. In order for creation to reach its potential, human beings had to work the ground. Human beings are involved in what happens. A little later in Genesis 2, you find God putting these human beings in the Garden of Eden, and their role is to work it and care for it. And apparently, they work and care for it because what happens? The trees bear fruit because the human beings see how appetizing the fruit is. And so human beings, they make a decision. They're making choices that's impacting literally what's happening in the world they have to work with. 
Of course, in Genesis 3, you then have an example of these very same human beings engaging in bad (laughs) decision-making. They're in good decision-making in chapter 2. They're working the ground. They're being blessed from it. Genesis 3, it's bad decision-making. God tells them, you could eat from any tree in the garden except for one. Notice this. God gives an amazing freedom of choice within his will. You can have any tree in the garden. It's Baskin Robbins, you know. You know, any, take your pick. The garden's a cafeteria. You can't eat from that one over there. Well, what do they do? Well, they eat from that one. And their bad decision making does what? It bears fruit that impacts their lives and the lives of others beyond them. By the way, do you remember what happens after their bad decision making? They refuse to take responsibility. That's the temptation, right? When you make a bad decision, you refuse to take responsibility. It's an episode called Let the Blames Begin. You know, let the games begin, let the blames begin. Where Adam and Eve both try and pass the buck. They blame God, they blame the serpent, even each other. Remember what Adam says? The woman you gave me, he blames God. You know. She blames the serpent. They're blaming each other. By the way, this just reminds you, taking responsibility for a bad decision, taking responsibility for a poor choice, taking responsibility for a sinful decision is one of the more difficult things to do. Now let me show you another passage. Proverbs 19.3, this is so powerful. A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Do you know people who are angry with God for where they are in life, and yet they can't see that they had something to do with where they are in life. Apparently, this is a human tendency, because the proverb writer writes this 4,000 years ago. A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. In other words, there are people who rage against God for something of their own doing. Our choices and our decisions are variables on the kind of lives we have. Let me show you another passage. Deuteronomy 11 and 26, another foundational passage. This is before the Israelites are entering into the promised land, and Moses gathers them before they get into a land of their own, and he wants to remind them about the importance of their choices. Deuteronomy 11 and 26, here we go. See, I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. The curse if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God. And turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods which you have not known. So watch what he does. When the Lord your God has brought you into the land you are entering to possess... You are to proclaim on Mount Gerizim the blessings and on Mount Ebal the curses. You are about to cross the Jordan to enter and take possession of the land the Lord your God is giving you. When you've taken it over and are living there, be sure that you obey all the decrees and laws I'm setting before you today. And so Moses is in the midst of giving them instructions before they enter into the promised land. He's telling them what's at stake in these instructions. And he's saying, hey, listen, if you live by these instructions, you'll have a blessed experience in the promised land. If you don't, you're going to turn your promised land into a wasteland. And this isn't this God saying, you do this, and then I push the blessing button in heaven like I'm a tit-for-tat God, an ATM God. That's not it. He's saying, I'm giving you instructions because this is the way life works. This is the way relationships work. And so I'm giving you these instructions. Follow this, these instructions And you'll find blessing as you follow them. Moses doesn't want them to forget what at stake. So he says, here's what I want you to do. When you enter into Canaan, I want you to go over to Mount Gerizim. And I want you to stand up there and I want you to proclaim the blessings God associates with his instruction. Why does he say I want you to go to Mount Gerizim? Because when they're going to get to Mount Gerizim, that's a position that they can see these fertile land and valleys in Canaan. It's a visual for them. It's like a high school athlete putting a poster of LeBron James on the inside of their locker or hanging a poster of Tiger Woods on their bedroom wall. They're getting a picture of this is what it's like 
as I continue to work hard. I'm getting this visual in my mind that, that it, it's a positive picture to focus on. He says, you're going to stand on Gerizim, and you're going to see this fertile land and valley, and you are to proclaim the blessings that come from walking in obedience with me. The fertile land and valley is just a visual of those blessings. You with me? And then he says, and then I want you to do, I want you to go over to Mount Ebal. That just sounds like a bad mountain. I want you to go over to Mount Ebal, and I want you to stand up there, and I want you to proclaim the curses that happen, the consequences that happen, the difficulty one finds when they don't walk in accordance with the Lord. Why Mount Ebal? Because from Mount Ebal, you just saw nothing but desolation, wilderness, rocks. That's all you saw. That's all you saw. It would be easy for somebody to say, this land is cursed, if they looked at everything from Mount Ebal, and that's there, they were to pronounce, they were to remind themselves, yeah, this is what life is going to be like if I don't live by these instructions. Now, this is Moses' plan to remind them. He wants them to have a visual that they have a say in their future. You get to determine blessing or curse. You see this theme, choices, and the difference they make in our lives carried into the New Testament. Let me show you one more passage. Famous passage. Paul's writing in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, one of the most well-known passages of Scripture. And Paul says this to believers, do not be deceived. Don't be deceived about this. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Don't be deceived about this. Human beings reap what they sow. Now, this can be a positive or negative thing depending upon what you sow, Right? If you want to reap okra, plant okra. If you want to reap tomatoes, plant tomatoes. But don't go planting corn and expecting onions. If you're married, don't go planting winter weather when you come home and expect a summer harvest. There's a principle to leverage here. A human being reaps what they sow. You have a say in what you reap in life. You exercise your say by what you plant, the decisions and the choices you make. Now, Paul continues in 6 and verse 8. Those who sow to please their sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. Question, what is it to... What is, how am I sowing according to my sinful nature? If you go back to the end of chapter 5, it's not on the slide. You can read what the acts of the sinful nature are. He gets into them. Things like immorality, idolatry, discord, jealousy, envy. He says if you live according to these things, you're going to reap destruction. My goodness. So we need to, we have to talk about this. There I, rightfully concerned. Everybody needs to be concerned about the spread of the virus. I get that. And there are people really concerned about the spread of the virus. But I'm telling you, he also says we need to have some of these same attitudes about sexual immorality, idolatry, discord, envy, debauchery, greed. We need to have the same proactive attitude about these things that we do about the virus right now. Because according to him, if I sow according to these things, I'm going to reap destruction. I'm going to reap destruction. Just think about that. We live in a culture right now in the country where rightfully we should be concerned about the virus. We should be protecting one another, absolutely. But my goodness, what if we got as serious about dealing with our greed or the affair that we're in or the addiction that we're having as we are about trying to keep everybody safe from the virus? Take the virus seriously. Yes, you know we're taking it seriously. I'm talking about... These other things, if we sow according to these other things, we reap destruction. Now he continues, those who sow to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. He's not talking about just heaven. Eternal life is a quality of life here on earth. We reap what we sow. By the way, this principle isn't canceled out after you come to Jesus and been forgiven of your sins. You can be forgiven and still subject to this principle. It doesn't say people reap what they sow unless they ask for forgiveness. 
Being forgiven of prior sins doesn't mean that you don't have to deal with their fruit. Listen to me. Just because you're tasting of the fruit of prior sins does not mean that you're not forgiven. Listen to me, okay? A lot of people think, oh, I'm still dealing with the consequences of poor choices I made earlier in life. That does not mean that God doesn't love you. That does not mean that you're not forgiven. This is just a fundamental reality. We reap what we sow. People say, Chris, I don't understand. I've been working so hard to follow Jesus this last year. Thanks be to God, you're forgiven, you're being transformed, but you still might have to deal with the crop from decisions you made from 10 years before that. It doesn't mean you're not loved. It doesn't mean that you're not changing. It just means that we all reap what we sow for better or for worse. You say, man, that's... that's Boy, that's challenging. I'm going to close with a good piece of news, but I want you to hang with me. Anytime I think about this subject of choices and decisions, I inevitably think about Renaud III. He was a 14th century duke in what's now Belgium. He was grossly overweight. He had this terrible fight with his younger brother, Edward. And Edward, Edward decided, I'm going to throw my brother, Renaud, in prison. And he did an interesting thing with him. He put, imprisoned him in Newkirk Castle, and he promised him, you can regain your title in your life as soon as you leave this room. And he put no lock on the door. Most normal-sized people could leave the room. It had normal-sized windows and a normal-sized door. But Renald was huge. If he was going to make it out of the room, he had to be able to fit through the door. He couldn't do it. He needed to lose weight. But Edward knew his brother, and so every day Edward sent a variety of the most delicious foods to the room, seven days a week. And instead of dieting his way out of prison, he only grew bigger. When Edward was accused of cruelty by others in his court, he always said the same thing. My brother is not a prisoner. He may leave when he so wills. And it said that Renald stayed in that room for almost a decade and wasn't released until his brother, Edward, died in battle. And by then his health was so ruined that he died within a year. Renald was a prisoner of his own choices. I'm going to tell you what, there's a lot we can't control in our world. But one thing we have a measure of control over is our decisions and our choices. We make our decisions, and our decisions make us. God has allowed us to have a certain measure of influence over the kind of world we live in, the kind of life we have, the kind of people we become. We're not the only influence. But we are a variable. We have a part to play. And that's why it's important to cultivate the kind of hearts and the gain the kind of understanding that helps us make better decisions. That's why we're kicking off the year this way. And let me say this before I close. If you're dealing with the bitter fruit of decisions made in the past, I want to encourage you. I'm thinking about Adam and Eve in the wake of their sin. They had to leave the garden. That was a consequence. But one of the things in the midst of them reaping, having to leave the garden, do you remember what God did for them? He clothed them in animal skins so that they wouldn't have to leave the garden vulnerable to the elements. And even though they were facing the consequences of a poor decision, God was there helping them too. Endure it. We don't have to do it alone. And of course, that picture in Genesis is a preview one day of what Jesus would do for all of us. He would cover us. Amen? Because of his death upon the cross, the one thing you and I don't ever have to face in the wake of sinful decisions is the absence of the presence of God. 
He will be with us and will help us bear up under the consequences when we're reaping from poor decisions in the past. By the way, it's worth not noting that even the bitter and rotten fruit that we deal with in our life, even the bitter and rotten fruit we deal with in our life from poor decisions can be used in a redemptive way by God. Really is. Let me tell you what, my granddad had pear trees in his backyard in Austin, Texas. I'll never forget this. I used to love his pears, but every now and then he had some nasty pears coming off that tree. And instead, I would find them and I'd want to throw them over the fence. He said, don't do that. Throw them over there. And I would throw all these rotten pears in this, what he called a compost pile. And I would throw all these rotten pears and my grandmother would throw out weird organic food in that pile and banana peels and stuff. That was their compost pile. That stuff would decompose. And you know what my granddad would do with that compost that had been formed from the decomposed rotten pears and banana peels? He'd turn around and take that compost and he'd spread around that pear trees. Make the soil more fertile, more rich. I'm going to tell you what, sometimes you're going to deal with the rotten fruit of bad decisions, but you know what? As you come to God, he can even take the rotten fruit of bad decisions. And yeah, that's right, it's manure. Smells like manure, tastes like manure, you don't like it. He can take that you know what and he can redeem it to enrich your life later, to inform you later so that maybe you don't make those same decisions. He can redeem it. It becomes a part of your testimony that maybe you can save some other people pain. He can redeem it so that it actually becomes a testimony so that people learn that God is a God who's a God of grace that forgives, is a God who's into recycling. He's into redemption. And he can take even the rotten fruit from sinful, poor decisions of our life and even do something redemptive with it so that you become more fruitful with better fruit later in life to nourish other people. You can't go back and change the past, but you can start where you are and change the future. And it's time to get busy living and do it as you follow Jesus. So I'm going to ask you, go ahead and take the bread and the cup that you have with you. Left you a question to ponder on the screen as we take communion together. People reap what they sow. How have you experienced this to be true in your own life in good or bad ways? Think about that. Let's go down memory lane in your life a little bit. Think about that. Give thanks for the good lessons you've learned along the way. And I invite you as you take the bread and cup with me to again just commit your life to Jesus. Lord, right now, I thank you for your presence. We are made in your image. Your word says in Psalm 135, the Lord does whatever pleases him. And to a degree, you have given us a measure of free will. That's one of the things it means to be made in your image. Thank you for the grace that we get to make some choices. But Lord, we just say that uh, we don't want to lean on our own understanding. And we just don't, we also say that our hearts aren't always in the best of places to make these choices. So, Lord, we want to learn how to make the choices in every area of our life that honors you, that brings blessing to others as well as blesses us, Lord. Thank you for the privilege of having a say about some matters in this world and some matters in our life. Lord, we pray that you will show us how to sow always according to the Spirit, not just so that we can be blessed, but so that a world can be blessed, Lord. Because we see a world, and even in our own lives, of so many people, including ourselves, that reap what they've sown in the past, and it's not pleasant, but we give you thanks for being a God that redeems even the rotten fruit as we bring ourselves to you, turns it into compost that makes the soil fertile for better decisions and a greater testimony down the line. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
you bring restoration you bring restoration you bring restoration to my soul you've taken my Call me by a new name. You've taken my shame, and in its place, you give me joy. You take my morning, turn it into dancing. You take my Turn it into laughing. You take my morning, turn it into dancing. You take my sadness, turn it into joy. You take my morning, turn it into dancing. You take my weeping, turn it into laughing. You take my morning. Turn it into dancing. You take my sadness, turn it into you bring joy. restoration. You bring restoration. You bring restoration to my. Taking my pain, you called me by a new name. You've taken my shame, and in its place, you give me joy. Take my morning, oh, you take my morning, turn it. To dancing, you take my weeping and turn it into laughing. You take my morning, turn it into dancing. You take my sadness and turn it into joy. You give me joy.
again for joining us today. We're really glad you were here. Uh, as we close, we just want to encourage you to spend some time in prayer. Maybe that's by yourself or with those that you've gathered with uh, in your homes and just uh, consider what the Lord might have for you to do this week. Uh, when we look forward to, to hearing some of those stories on social media, on Facebook, on Instagram, wherever you might be. Uh, and we'll see you next time.